Good evening. I'm Marilyn Heron, director of the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education at Chapman University. Welcome to tonight's virtual event sponsored by the Rogers Center in partnership with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Tonight's presentation is the keynote event in the Conference for Holocaust Education Centers, which will be held on the Chapman University campus tomorrow. Last week, author Michael Dobbs shared with the Chapman audience the story of how American government action and inaction impacted the Jews of one German village. In the words of journalist Dorothy Thompson, the fate of a Jew seeking to emigrate depended on, quote, the piece of paper with a stamp on it, unquote. Tonight, historian, archivist, and curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Dr. Rebecca Arabelding, widens the focus beyond the inhabitants of that one village as she explores themes from the America and the Holocaust exhibit at the museum and examines from multiple perspectives the question of how much responsibility comes with knowledge of persecution and genocide. Dr. Arabelding is the author of the authoritative history of the War Refugee Board entitled Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe. Her book was honored with the 2018 National Jewish Book Award for writing based on archival material. We welcome your questions during the program for the Q&A that will follow Dr. Erbelding's presentation. Jessica Mylamuk, Associate Director of the Rogers Center, will moderate this post-presentation conversation. Please use the Q&A feature, not the chat box, to submit your questions. This event is being recorded and the discussion will be posted online next week. And now, Dr. Erbelding. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, thank you so much to Jessica Milamuk and Dr. Marilyn Heron for welcoming me. I wish we could be in person. Um, they have assured me that it is raining cats and dogs in California and that I don't want to be there, but I think they're lying to me. Um, and it's great to see so many of you out here, even if we have to be on another Zoom. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about the current special exhibition at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which as you can see on your screen is entitled Americans in the Holocaust. Um, this exhibition opened in April 2018. I'm going to talk about some of the new research that we did um, in preparation for the exhibit and some of the behind the scenes stuff. But I also want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for questions because I know this is a topic that a lot of people feel very strongly about and that they have a lot of questions about. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have related to this history at all. So even if I don't cover it, if there's something you're wondering about, please feel free to put that in the Q&A box and I'm happy to answer it when we get to the Q&A section. Um, so to, to kind of back up a little bit, we began working on this exhibition in 2014. Um, the museum tends to do big exhibitions that are open for a long period of time. So this one was about four years in the making before it opened to the public. Um, and we, it was clear from 2014, really from the beginning, that we were going to try to tell a new story. For a long time, a lot of the scholarship around the United States and the Holocaust has focused on President Roosevelt. What did the president know? What did he do? Or on a few specific topics, like the voyage, the, the ill-fated voyage of the MS St. Louis, or the debate over whether or not the United States should or could have bombed the Auschwitz death camp. This previous and these previous narratives kind of generalized, um, said or implied that Americans knew nothing about what was going on and they did nothing about it. Or conversely, they knew everything about what was happening and still they did nothing about it. But we knew, and I think it, it, I think it makes sense if you think about it, that Americans do not speak with one voice. We never have. We don't now, we didn't back then. And so there were massive public debates at the time over how Americans should react to persecution and later to mass murder. 
Um, and that Roosevelt is not the only person worth paying attention to. So the president is not the entirety of the government. So even within the government, we wanted to broaden our reach to look at Congress and to different departments. The Treasury and Labor Department, for example, advocated on behalf of Jews and the State Department obstructed those efforts. The mandate of the museum is really to ask difficult questions. We don't always pose answers to them, but we, we like to ask them and we hope that our visitors debate them as we go forward. Um, so you can see two questions here. These are also the questions that frame the door as you're entering the exhibition. The first one, what did Americans know? This is a question that we try to answer over the course of the exhibition. And then what more could have been done? And this is the one we don't answer. This is the one that we leave for people to debate and discuss amongst themselves. So first, we decided really early on that we weren't going to rely on hindsight. This is one of the, I think, flaws of some of that earlier scholarship is that the authors know the end of the story. They know that the persecution of the Jews in the 1930s will end with genocide. And so they treat the people who are acting in the 30s as though they should have known that a genocide was coming. And when you look at, I mean, to be fair, when you look at early newspaper accounts of Nazi persecution of Jews in 1933, there is the impulse to want to scream at people and say, don't you know, like, don't you know it's time to get out? Don't you know that we need to fix our immigration laws? But of course, Jews in Europe did not know that the Holocaust was to come. Americans did not know that the Holocaust was to come. For the most part, the Nazis did not know that the Holocaust was to come. And so we want our visitors to understand the context of the period, to not look at this with hindsight. And obviously that is walking a bit of a tightrope. Um, providing context can sometimes seem like providing an excuse for inaction. And obviously that's not what we want to do, but we also can't look at historical debates in isolation. We need to think about why people may have felt the way that they did. So you can walk through um, and understand this history through the lens of isolationism of the memory of World War I, how it made Americans cautious to engage overseas, um, suspicious of foreigners who might drag the United States into war, and maybe distrustful of reports about atrocities overseas, remembering reports from World War I that had turned out to be untrue. It is also the story of immigration. It is a story of who is allowed to come and when and how, and the ways in which isolation isolationism and race and anti-Semitism all play into immigration. It is also the story of racism and anti-Semitism. Um, the constant tension over who gets the benefits of being an American, uh, which is a debate that has lasted through the whole of our country. Uh, how Americans could protest the treatment of Germany's Jews while living through their own society in which African Americans are not equal. Um, where there are quotas against Jews at universities and hotels and golf clubs that banned non-Aryans um, in this country, debates inside and outside the Jewish community over how much they could push, how much they could risk a rise in anti-Semitism. It is also the story of a nation in the midst of a serious economic crisis, one that is difficult for us to fathom even today. In 1933, four years into the depression, as Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany and Roosevelt is inaugurated President of the United States, 25% of the American workforce was unemployed. Immigrants were seen as potential job stealers and most Americans were more focused on domestic recovery than on any crisis that was happening abroad. So our exhibit unfolds in, in four chapters. Um, the first from 1933 to 1938 asks, what did Americans know? Um, this, was, this was really critical for us to address, particularly as our visitors are walking through the exhibit doors, because if we can't show and prove from the beginning that Americans could have had access to information, we can't make the argument that they could or should have done anything about it. You have to know about something to be upset about it, to protest it, to do something about it. Um, so one of the things that we found almost immediately is that Americans actually did have quite a lot of information about the Nazi persecution of Jews. These magazine covers are, the one on the left is 1932, the one on the right is 1936. So pretty early on. Um, the one on the left, I really love this Vanity Fair cover um, because it, it is November 1942, or I'm sorry, November 1932. So it is two months before 
Hitler is appointed chancellor. And you can see that the artists at Vanity Fair assumed that you as an American knew enough about a foreign political party and its leader and its iconography that they could do this kind of mocked up swastika with jazz hands and Hitler's face, and that you as an American would know what they were mocking with this cover. Um, it's kind of incredible. I can't think of any political party or any political person overseas that you could do that with today. Um, Joseph Goebbels on the cover of Time Magazine in the summer of 1933, this is July, 1933. Goebbels obviously is the Nazi minister of propaganda. And the tagline at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the tagline at the bottom says, say it in your dreams, the Jews are to blame. So Americans know from the beginning, from 1933, that Nazi ideology um, and the Nazi party are built into this idea of isolationism, um, that those two things are part and parcel. Um, and there are newspaper coverage, through, there is newspaper coverage throughout the country of early persecution of Jews. Um, you can see here, for instance, this is the Bakersfield Californian. Um, it's a little fuzzy, but this is March 29th, 1933. Uh, it is a few days before the Nazi boycott of um, Jewish owned businesses in Germany. And I love looking at these kind of old newspapers. You can see here the beginning of the New Deal. You can see um, that the Nazis were boycotting stores. It's right um, here in the middle. Many stores close under Hitler edict. But the key thing is, that the Nazi boycott of Jewish businesses is April 1st. It is three days from the time in advance in the future of, of the time that this paper was printed. And so this is the future. This is the Bakersfield Californian reporting on what was going to happen in Germany um, because the Nazis announced it in advance and Americans knew about it in advance of it actually happening. Um, and these stories about the boycott of Jewish owned businesses, of Jews being kicked out of the civil service in Germany, about books being burned, um, a lot of it really did resonate with the American people. They were paying attention despite the depression, despite the beginning of the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal. There are marches and rallies in at least 65 different cities nationwide. Um, the State Department and the, FB and the and FDR received more than 500 petitions from all over the country of um, towns and cities and organizations asking the government to do something. Nobody's quite sure what, but something. Um, on May 10th, 1933, timed to book burning in Nazi Germany, New York City saw the largest protest march in New York City history to that point. Um, people marched for six hours down Broadway protesting what the Nazis were doing in Germany. The challenge is that Americans by and large have a short attention span. Um, by the summer, there weren't these kind of big efforts uh, in Germany to persecute Jews. And so um, it fell off the front pages and Americans kind of refocused on domestic concerns, refocused on the, the beginning of the New Deal and lots of all of this legislation being passed. And so Americans refocus at home. And the issue comes up a few more times during the, the mid 1930s. It comes up in 1935 as Americans debate whether or not we should boycott the Nazi Olympics or the, the, the Summer Olympics in, that were to be held in Berlin in 1936. But for the most part, stories about Nazi Germany were on the insides of newspapers. Even as the Spanish Civil War began, as Japan invaded China, as Italy invaded Ethiopia, Americans doubled and tripled down on this idea of isolationism, that no matter what happens abroad, we are going to stay on our side of the ocean that what happens abroad is not our concern. In March, 1938 though, Germany annexed Austria, bringing about 192,000 members of the Jewish community under Nazi control. And the restrictions on Jewish life in Germany, the loss of citizenship, restrictions on employment and education, um, all of this hit Austrian Jews immediately. The things that had kind of trickled and gotten, gotten warmer, the frog in the boiling water, it got warmer and warmer and warmer in Germany, it hits really fast in the spring of 1938 in Austria. Um, and it became clear that for many people that staying in Europe was no longer safe. And so this banner reads, the same blood belongs in the same Reich. So you can see here that a few months after the Anschluss in November, 1938, the Kristallnacht attacks, the coordinated burning of synagogues throughout Nazi controlled territory, 
Um, stores owned by Jews were ransacked, apartments were looted, 30,000 Jewish men and boys were arrested and sent to concentration camps. And Kristallnacht made headlines throughout the United States for at least three weeks, um, which is even more striking. As you look at this newspaper, you can see um, that this is the main headline news, despite the fact that, that up here, um, it is the day before the 20th anniversary of the end of World War I. Uh, Pearl Buck has just been given the Nobel Prize. Kamil Ataturk, the father of modern Turkey, is, has died. It's also two days after the midterm elections of 1938, in which the Democrats maintain their majority, but take a serious beating. They lose, I think, 72, if I remember correctly, they lose 72 seats in the House um, and Senate seven Senate seats. And so it is a, a big reproach for Roosevelt and his administration. Um, all of that is happening on top of each other. And the big headline is rioting Nazis persecute Jews in the Petaluma Argus Courier. Um, this is how Americans react. Again, some Americans do react at this point. This is a protest in Los Angeles right after Kristallnacht. And you can see people carrying signs united against fascism. Nazi Germany has no place among the civilized nations. Roosevelt had denounced what the Nazis had done. He had brought back the US ambassador um, from Germany as a sign of protest. The US is the only country to bring back our ambassador as a sign of protest after Kristallnacht. Um, and he allowed between 12 and 15,000 people who were here on visitors visas to remain indefinitely if they didn't feel safe going home. So people who were here on tourist visas that didn't wanna go back to Germany could stay, um, that got extended and so they could stay for the rest of the war. So that's 12 or 15 to 15,000 people who did not have to go back to Nazi Germany. Um, and we have examples of that in our collection of people who stayed for the entirety of the war because of that decision by Roosevelt. So that's why you see someone say, we greet our president for his denunci denunciation of the Nazis. But the 1930s was also the first decade of widespread public opinion polling. George Gallup is setting up his operation and, and this um, expands our lens of what average Americans thought about these topics. So we got really lucky when we were planning the exhibition. Gallup really sets up in 1934, 1935. So we don't have any polls from the very, very beginning of the Nazi era um, or the Roosevelt administration, but we do for most of the 1930s. In fact, Americans go polling that. They love participating in public opinion polls. They write into magazines expressing their opinions on everything from who is your favorite cabinet member to how many newspapers do you subscribe to, to what soda do you drink? So we have a lot of data on people in the 1930s, including this uh, or these two polls, which were done by the same people um, about three weeks after Kristallnacht. So you can see on the left, um, people were asked, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? 94% of Americans disapprove. And then the exact same people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live. And 72% of those people say no. So it's this disconnect between sympathy and being willing to be part of what is then the obvious solution of immigration um, runs really through this entire um, exhibition. It is very important to note at this point that the United States has no refugee policy. So we use the word Jewish refugees um, because we are talking about people who are escaping political persecution and racial persecution. And that was the word that was used at the time. But it did not mean that there was any sort of refugee law that people were coming through. Um, you can't come and seek asylum. You can't come as a migrant. Um, all of the kind of modern ideas we have about refugees maybe being in a separate legal category, um, deserving of special consideration in a way that is different from immigrants. That does not exist in the 1930s. Everyone is coming as an immigrant and you are coming under the same slow, deliberate, contemplative, paperwork heavy, bureaucratic immigration process as somebody who is leaving for economic reasons or to join family and is willing to take that kind of long period of time to put together all of your paperwork. There are no exceptions made for people who are fleeing um, or people who need to get out for some sort of, because there's violence against them. U.S. immigration at the time was rooted in the 1924 Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which is sometimes called the National Origins Act. Um, it was passed in 1924 in the middle of this isolationist wave 
It is the height of the belief in the pseudoscience of eugenics, the idea that some people are biologically better than others. It is passed in the middle of the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan in the United States. So as I said earlier, this, this act set kind of overall laws on immigration. I mentioned new immigration laws and that's what I was referring to is this cap on overall immigration um, first at about 164,000 people per year. And then in 1929, it's reduced to about 153,000 people per year. Remember that, that in the, the early part of the 20th century, in the first decade of the 20th century, there are years where 1.2, 1.4 million people arrive. So automatically you are cutting it in, in tenth. Um, it is a tenth of what it had been 20 years earlier. Um, Again, the law is based in racism and eugenics, this, this popular idea that biologically some people are better than others, and that the United States can improve as a country if we bring in biologically better immigrants. And those immigrants were defined at the time as basically white Protestants. And so each country got a sliver of that 153,000 people per year. And the countries that they that in the 1920s they thought would produce reliably white Protestant immigrants got a larger part of that sliver. Great Britain, for example, gets 65,000, nearly half of all immigrants to the United States, all visa slots available were reserved for people born in Great Britain or Ireland. Um, Germany is actually the second highest um, after 1920, or I'm sorry, after 1938 and the German annexation of Austria. Uh, 27,370 people born in either Germany or Austria who come to the United States any year. Um, there are about 1,100 total immigrants um, allowed from the entire continent of Africa. There are parts of Asia where immigration was um, not allowed at all. So you can see the quotas are based on your country of birth, not your nationality. So where you were born determined how many visas were available to people like you, people born in that country. Um, and crucially for the Holocaust, Ellis Island is no longer the place where you go to present your paperwork and find out if you're going to be allowed in the United States. All of your paperwork, all of your interviews, all of your approval process, all of that is done back in the country in which you're living. And so State Department diplomats are now, um, now, tasked with doing all of these interviews, granting the immigration visas. And so when you board the boat, when you get to the, the border of the United States by ship, you're given kind of a very cursory medical exam and then you can go reunite your fam with your family. You know, all of the paperwork had been done back in Europe. So it is incredibly difficult to come to the United States. Um, yet in the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of European Jews sought to immigrate out of Europe and into the United States. They had to prove their identities with a long list of documents. They had to have birth certificates, marriage certificates, medical discharge papers. They had to have, most of them had to have evidence that they had an American financial sponsor, someone who would vouch for them that they would never become what was called a public charge. Um, this was something that Herbert Hoover had put in place um, even before Roosevelt took office in 1930 as a way to combat the Great Depression. We can't allow any immigrants in who are going to need any sort of public services. So for most immigrants, um, Jews and non-Jews, refugees and non-refugees, um, you needed an American financial sponsor. You needed somebody who would vouch for you that you are not going to become a public charge. And that person needs, needs to submit their own tax documents, their own bank statements, their own insurance forms, um, often letters of recommendation from people in their community saying that you are a good person who will not allow um, the immigrant to become a public charge if that person is allowed in. Um, and you can see here this, the same quote that, that Marilyn mentioned from Michael Dobbs' talk. Um, Dorothy Thompson, the famous female journalist, wrote this in a book. Um, about refugees in 1938. It's a fantastic commentary on the inhumanity of our times that for thousands and thousands of people, a piece of paper with a stamp on it is the difference between life and death. In the summer of 1938, even before Kristallnacht, Roosevelt saw this refugee crisis forming um, and he saw it as a massive and an international problem that he thought needed an international solution. It can't be just on the United States. So he called a conference in Evian, France 
32 nations attended. Um, almost all of them, including the United States, stated that they were not going to change their immigration laws uh, to address this crisis. Like the public polls showed us, people and countries were not sympathetic, uh, or were sympathetic, but they were not willing to take any sort of action. Um, by June 1939, more than 300,000 people born in Germany, most of them Jewish, were on waiting lists to come to the United States. One of the other challenges that immigrants faced physically was trying to leave Europe and make it to the United States. In 1938, dozens of passenger ships crossed the Atlantic. Um, you can see here that most travel was done by ship and you can see this is a clip from a longer film in our exhibition. And I can talk about how we put this together if you want, but you can see dozens of ships um, leaving every month bringing thousands of people to the United States. These are all boats that were carrying people who self-identified as Jewish refugees. And they are coming from all over Europe, from Hamburg, from Danzig, from Belgium, from the Netherlands, from Northern France, from all over, from Italy. Um, each ship depicted is carrying someone who self-identified, someone or many people who self-identified as Jewish refugees. But if you know about this period, you probably also know the story of the MS St. Louis which um, carried more than 900 mostly Jewish refugees. The St. Louis is actually an anomaly story. Um, many people think that it is an example of one of many ships that uh, was turned away by the United States. And that is actually not true. Most immigrants successfully arrived at their destination because they had already done all of their paperwork back in Europe. Um, they had gotten their immigration visas. They were ready to go, ready to arrive in the United States. But the passengers who were on the St. Louis leaving Germany in May 1939 did not have US immigration visas. They had landing visas to enter Cuba. And when they arrived in the port of Havana, they learned that the Cuban government had invalidated their visas, um, that they had purchased their visas from a corrupt Cuban official. And even though the shipping company thought, well, they're not gonna retroactively cancel things that had already been issued, um, the shipping company was wrong and the Cuban government had invalidated these visas. After negotiations to allow them to land failed, the Cuban government ordered the St. Louis outside territorial, Cuban territorial waters. Um, the US and Canada refused to make exceptions for the passengers since the passengers did not have immigration um, visas. They had not passed any sort of screening. They did not have their paperwork in order um, and the ship turned back towards Europe. An American aid organization, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, worked with the State Department to negotiate with the governments of Great Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France to divvy up the passengers. So the St. Louis, I think this is also a myth, the idea that the, Saint, the passengers on the St. Louis went back to Germany. They didn't. Um, they were deposited in Western Europe. And this was actually considered a success story at the time. The Joint made a fundraising video about what a great job they had done with the passengers of the St. Louis. The passengers threw a party on board the ship on the way back. Um, but of course, we know that within months, Europe would go to war. And by the following spring, Nazi Germany would invade the Netherlands, Belgium, and France, where three quarters of the passengers had disembarked. Um, and those passengers, the ones who had not managed to immigrate to the United States in the, in the previous year, um, were in danger again. And the war, and the outbreak of war um, had a real impact on the refugee crisis. So Europe, as you can see, goes to war September uh, 1st, 1939, but the United States technically remained neutral for two more years. And there was a feeling promoted by some in the US government and evident in polls from the time that immigrants could be Nazi spies. So you see on the right, a warning from the FBI about spies and saboteurs. And on the left, one of, uh, I would say, a trend of different articles, some of them written by J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, and some like this one, Hitler's Slave Spies in America, arguing that Hitler and the Nazis are placing spies in the United States, spies and saboteurs, and that some of them are coming as Jewish refugees. Even Roosevelt kind of got in on this. And in June 1940, as France was falling, he gave a speech, and, or I'm sorry, he spoke at a press conference and he said that even Jewish refugees could be spies. They may not want to be spies, but their poor parents back in Europe are being held hostage in exchange for these acts of spying and sabotage. And so therefore, we need to have more restrictions in place, better screenings 
from the State Department of anybody who is applying to immigrate to the United States. And so immigrants had to pass more paperwork, a closer inspection um, in order to get visas to immigrate. And as Germany invaded more territory, physical immigration was impacted as well. Often we think about how restrictionist the US government was, and it was, how difficult it was to get out of Germany from the Nazi perspective, the barriers that the Nazis put in place, and they did. But it's also really difficult to cross a continent at war and then an ocean where there are U-boats and, and a battle for the Atlantic. And so you saw the, um, the ship's animation from 1938. This is what it looked like two years later in 1941. You can see that there are only a few ships, passenger ships crossing the Atlantic, almost all of them from Lisbon, Portugal. One of the things that we found is we were putting this animation together and gathering all of this data of all of the ships that were coming is that the second the war touched an area, that um, shipping from that area shut down. And so September 1939, you can no longer board a ship to the United States from Germany or from Poland. Um, April 1940, Denmark and Norway are out. May 1940, the Netherlands, Belgium and Northern France are out. Um, and that is a lot of where people were living. And so if you are, say, Otto Frank, uh, father of Anne Frank, and you're living in Amsterdam, you would have to cross um, a continent at war in getting entry and exit visas of every place you wanted to go so that you could get to Lisbon and board and get a ticket for one of the very few passenger ships crossing the Atlantic every month. Um, it really was, the war really was a huge impediment to people getting out. There's a major debate in the United States over whether to go to war with organizations like America First. Um, there's a kind of isolationist organization um, piece of propaganda on the left and a piece of propaganda from pro-war, well, not pro-war, but pro-intervention organization, uh, if it's fun to be free on the right. So the America First people are saying, war is a smokescreen for your blunders. You are sending boys to death with a smile. Um, on the right, they are making the argument that this is what needs to happen, that we need to proactively get involved in the war because otherwise we're going to get attacked. And if we're attacked, it will be very dangerous for us. It's better to help Great Britain, to help the Soviet Union um, and keep war from our shores. Obviously this debate between whether we're going to stay neutral, whether we're going to get involved, all of the debates about Lend-Lease, everything like that, end on December 7th, 1941, when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and the United States formally enters the war. And you see in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, how US propaganda posters frame the war. So you can see on the left, there is a Nazi fist putting a dagger through the Bible. Um, on the right, a Nazi hand crushing the constitution, the Bill of Rights and Labor Freedom, going up in flames. That is the way that the war is posed to Americans. That is what um, we are told that the war is about. It is about democracy and freedom. It is about stopping a fascist country from military takeover and territorial uh, aggression. It is not framed as a war for Jews because it was, not, um, it was not a war for Jews. The United States did not go to war to rescue Jews or to aid Jews or to help Jews. Um, the Holocaust was not part of our calculus as to whether to go to war. But in November, 1942, Americans learned for the first time that the Nazis had a plan to murder the Jews of Europe. And they find out in a rather roundabout way, you can see this Western Union cable here, uh, a Jewish organization, the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, um, learned about the plan um, to, you can see here, alarming report in Führer's headquarters discussed and under consideration all Jews in countries occupied or controlled Germany, number three and a half to four million, should after deportation and concentration at East, in, at one blow exterminated to resolve once and for all Jewish question in Europe. So this is actually a two part, a two um, page cable. And on the second page, it says, we're not sure this is true. And this is scheduled to happen in the fall. And so those are two things that are, that are actually wrong. Mass murder had already been happening. It is not discussed and under consideration. It has been in effect for about a year. Um, and it is actually happening. At the same time that the United States finally confirms this. So that cable reached the United States in late August. The State Department was able to confirm the information by November. Um, the State Department 
talked to the Vatican, they talked to the Red Cross, they talked to the Swiss, they talked to people who had eyes and ears throughout Europe. And all of those people reported back saying, yes, this sounds right. Yes, this does seem to be what's happening. Um, even American aid workers who were still in Southern France, remember the Nazis had not invaded Southern France yet. And so there were American aid workers there who were witnessing deportations from inside camps in Southern France deportations up to Drancy and then over to Auschwitz. And so they had a sense of what was happening and they were writing back to the US saying, there are deportations, they say it's for work, but why are they taking the children? Why are they taking the elderly people first? It doesn't make any sense. This is the story that made sense. The idea that the Nazis had a plan and were carrying out a plan to murder all of the Jews of Europe. At the same time that the um, State Department is confirming this, November, 1942, and it's in newspapers throughout the country, um, that is the same month that the Allies are invading North Africa in, Af in Operation Torch. So the Allies and the Allied military is thousands of miles away from the killing centers um, where most people were being murdered. The Allied forces, as you can see on the right, issued condemnation of the murders, um, but they don't promise rescue. They, most of them don't think that rescue is possible. It's better to just win the war as soon as possible and to promise to punish the perpetrators afterwards. But more and more information comes out, especially throughout 1943, the information has been confirmed now. And so more and more information is coming out of Europe, real time reports of the uprising in the Warsaw ghetto, of mass murder by gas in different places. Um, and there's more pressure on the US to do something, particularly as the war turns, as it becomes much more likely that the allies are going to win as the Nazis are turned from the Soviet Union and start retreating there is more pressure to say, maybe we can do both. Maybe we can win the war as soon as possible. And we can also try to rescue as many people as we can so that they'll be alive by the end, still at the end of the war. In January, 1944, the Treasury Department, um, which had been investigating why the State Department was obstructing humanitarian aid to Europe, um, argued to Roosevelt that he needed to create a new government agency tasked with carrying out rescue. Separate from the war effort, um, specifically designated to try to rescue the Jews of Europe and other persecuted minorities. Roosevelt finally agrees in January 1944, and he signs an executive order establishing a war refugee board, officially announcing that this kind of rescue was U.S. policy and tasking this new agency, the War Refugee Board, with carrying out the policy. Among a lot of other things, the War Refugee Board um, hires Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman, and sends him to Budapest to help Jews there. Um, they drop um, leaflets from planes. They send radio broadcasts into Nazi and occupied territory and allied territory allied with Nazi Germany saying, we are going to punish you after the war. We are going to win the war. Why do you want to become a war, cr a war criminal now? Um, we are going to punish the perpetrators and reiterating what is happening and what allied intent for punishment was going to be. Um, they opened a refugee camp in upstate New York, bringing over a thousand, or uh, I'm sorry, almost a thousand, mostly Jewish refugees to live there. Uh, this is the only group of refugees that is brought to the United States outside of our immigration policy. And they are kept there until early 1946. The War Refugee Board sent 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. So if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package, it was almost certainly packed on Long Island, shipped across the Atlantic, disguised as a Red Cross package, you can see here a Red Cross marking, and delivered to Dachau, to Sachsenhausen, to Buchenwald um, in the final weeks of the war. They also released a report which they titled German Extermination Camps Auschwitz and Birkenau. This was a report that had been written by escapees from Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. Um, that report got to the War Refugee Board's representative in Switzerland who translated it into English, sent it to the United States. The War Refugee Board without asking anybody in the government or anybody else um, decided that they were going to publish it and distribute it to the press. Um, it resulted in headline news, Thanksgiving weekend, 1944. And a few days after that resulted in a Washington Post editorial entitled Genocide. It was the first time that word had been used in an American newspaper. And they argue, this is a new word. This word has just been um, devised by Polish 
uh, scholar Raphael Lemkin, who himself will lose over 40 family members in the Holocaust. And he is arguing that this is a new kind of crime, what the Nazis are doing, and we need a new word for it. And based on what our War Refugee Board has just told us, the American people need to learn this word, genocide. Our exhibit ends with the end of the war in 1945. And we, we really debated how to end. Do you end with displaced persons? Do you end with a change in refugee policy? Well, the US doesn't have the refugee policy that we have now until 1980. We can't take an exhibit all the way to 1980. Do you end with war crimes trials? It is very difficult. Beginnings and ends are always very difficult. And for us, we finally decided, you know what? This is an exhibit called America and the Holocaust. And the Holocaust ends in 1944. Everything that happens because of the Holocaust is still happening today. We can't escape the ripple effects of this genocide. Um, but the, the Holocaust itself ends with the defeat of Nazi Germany and the liberation of concentration camps. Um, so on, uh, in April 1945, General Eisenhower, who you can see here, if you can see my mouse, um, toured the Ordruf concentration camp. And despite everything that he heard about in, in his propaganda briefings, I mean, he had even authored a leaflet that was dropped over Germany warning perpetrators. Um, he's horrified by what he saw. And he immediately called members of Congress, um, journalists. He ordered every soldier who was in the vicinity of a newly liberated concentration camp to go and tour it so that he could show that it would never again be chalked up to propaganda that the Holocaust was going to be treated as fact um, in the future. It's very prescient um, from him actually to establish for so many people that this was what had happened. So that's the news in Europe. The news in the United States is that President Roosevelt had died. Um, Roosevelt dies the same day that General ha Eisenhower tours Ordriff. He dies of a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia. Um, so Roosevelt does not live to see images of liberation. The war in Europe ended in early May at the same time that Americans saw for the first time widespread evidence of the Holocaust. So there are a number of really big enduring questions throughout the exhibition. This is our, our online exhibition page. And so if you want to review anything that I, that I said or go through and learn more about the history, I really encourage you to go to our online exhibition. Um, it has almost all the films that we created for the gallery, a lot of artifacts, a lot of images, a lot of stories, um, some really great infographics that help explain how immigration worked, how many people made it to the United States, what it took to make it to the United States. But really the whole exhibition asks these huge questions. What responses, you can see some of them here, what responses were possible and when? Um, how do we understand the gap between knowledge and understanding? and understanding and belief? And then how do we make the jump between belief and action? When I believe something is happening, how do I, how do I, how do we as a community, how do we as a nation move to action? Why did some Americans choose to act while others did not? Um, and why is there such a gap between the humanitarian ideals that we talk about, about ourselves as a nation and the political realities that we often, so often find ourselves mired in? Um, so I'm going to stop now, uh, and hopefully we've got plenty of time for your questions, and thank you so much again. Thank you, Dr. Rebelding, um, for your excellent presentation. Um, I do have some questions uh, for you, and I'm going to start with kind of um, going backward a little bit to one of the slides you showed earlier with the demonstrations. Um, okay. Were the early demonstrations against the Nazis primarily in major cities like New York City, and I think the one you showed was in Los Angeles, um, mm -hmm. and were they largely organized by Jewish groups? Yeah, it's interesting. So, so there are rallies and marches in 65 cities. Um, so St. Louis, Chicago, Pittsburgh, New York, obviously have very big rallies. Um, but what interested me more than the rallies and the marches were the petitions. Because the petitions, everybody's writing their own language about what they think is happening and what they want the US to do about it. Um, the city of Dallas, Texas sends a petition, but so does the Irish Voters League of Maine. Um, so, so, does the Jewish, so do the Jewish students of the University of Minnesota. Um, so does the, um, there's an, uh, I think the Socialist Party of Oregon sends one. And so it is organizations large and small. So you have entire cities who say 10,000 of us gathered 
it was interfaith, the mayor was there, here is our petition. And then you see some where it's 20 signatures at the end and it's this neighborhood committee, but it's a neighborhood committee to fight the Nazis and it's 1933. And so what do they know about the Nazis? Why, why is this the thing that breaks through to them? And that's something that is really interesting to me because we don't think about that. We, we think, well, clearly they didn't know anything. Clearly they weren't paying attention. And I think back and every, it feels like it's something that almost went viral um, in a modern day sense of the word. It was an issue that went viral and everyone was talking about it for about two months and then they stopped talking about it. Um, and so that is one of the questions I think for me is how do you sustain a movement? And I think for many activists, that is something that is very difficult um, to continue to get public interest. And it is very clear that in the spring of 1933, there's a lot of public interest as to what was happening. But does it just die out because there are no major um, persecution events? Does it die out because there's not a lot of newspaper coverage after that? Um, why, why was it only a sustained movement in a few um, largely Jewish spaces? A lot of the marches and rallies, just to get to the second question really fast, a lot of the marches and rallies were organized by Jewish groups or labor groups, but not exclusively. Many of them were interfaith. Um, or even if they were organized by Jewish groups, all of the speakers were representing Protestant and Catholic groups as well. Thank you. Um, I had a, a, a guest write that their understanding is that um, until the final solution was, final solution in quotes, um, was adopted, uh, Hitler wanted Jews to leave, but few countries would take them. Um, if that's so, why was it so difficult to get ships with Jewish refugees to leave countries taken over by Germany, but ships left from other countries? Okay, I think if I understand this question properly, um, there is this kind of disconnect between, yes, the Nazis want Jews to leave. They absolutely do. That is Nazi policy until really the final solution begins, or it gets a little fuzzy around 1939, 1940 about what they want to do. Um, but they also cannot afford for Jews to leave with their wealth. Um, Germany is also suffering under the depression. They cannot afford to have members of the Jewish community, which still doesn't even represent 1% of the German population, but they cannot have them leave and take their money and their property with them. Germany, the German government actually cannot afford that kind of currency transfer. And so what they need to do is they need to rob the Jews before they can go. Um, and so they impose very strict taxes, limits on how much money people can transfer out. And that means that these Jewish immigrants, these potential Jewish immigrants cannot find a country to go to because they can't show that they can support themselves once they got there. They have been stripped of their wealth. Many of them may be lawyers or doctors encountering an entirely new system in South America with a language they don't speak. And so it is very difficult to get a country that is willing to take you if you don't have money and, and it doesn't look like you're gonna be able to work. And so there is this disconnect there. Um, so in terms of um, ships, uh, it's really any place that the Nazis occupy or that they're aligned with. In 1939, 40 and 41, that's when those countries shut down to shipping. So Italy shuts down in 1940 because they're aligned with Nazi Germany. And so the countries where people can still leave from, Spain and Portugal are countries that stay neutral um, or at least non-belligerent during the war. Um, it, since you had mentioned Portugal, I, somebody actually did ask um, if you could talk a little bit about Lisbon and why Portugal's position differed from the position of other European countries. So I don't know. I mean, I think you pretty much answered it there, but I didn't know yeah. if you had anything else you might want to add. It's neutral and it's got a buffer of Spain <laughs> is, is really the big thing. And so after a certain point as Germany, especially as Germany starts to lose and as the allies really start fighting, um, Portugal is not so worried about getting invaded anymore. Um, I highly recommend Marion Kaplan's new book about Jewish refugees in Portugal. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I have it on my shelf over here, but it's really excellent if your family went through Portugal or, um, and a lot of people's families did, um, or if you're interested in, in the Holocaust in Portugal, I highly recommend Marion Kaplan's new book. On the American side, you know, so not talking about people leaving, we're not talking about that right now, but the um, 
what was the US government response to the pro-Nazi efforts and sympathizers here in the United States? Do you have any research about that? Yeah, um, I mean, this is around the time that the House on american Activities Committee starts. And originally they start in the early 30s, partly going after the Nazis and partly going after the communists. Um, because there, there is a huge fear of communism in the US in the 1930s too. And sometimes communism, you know, in terms of stereoty anti-Semitic stereotypes, sometimes communism is linked with Jews. Um, and that was true in the US too. But the US does try to shut down the German, Amer the first the Friends of New Germany, and then that organization becomes the German American Bund. Um, so that really gets shut down in 19, late 1939. Um, they get the leader of the Bund on corrupt, uh, corruption charges, and that really signals the end of the Bund movement. Um, they go after Charles Coughlin, the, the anti-Semitic radio priest, the members of the Christian Front, members of the Silver Shirts, some of these pro-fascist, anti seriously anti-Semitic organizations. Um, you know, the, the U.S. government and in many communities, um, there are movements to try to shut those organizations down. Um, and those that is largely successful by the war. Um, and really by 1940, they are, do not have a strong presence in the US. Uh, you spoke earlier about the response uh, around Kristallnacht, um, that there were the protests and the things you, that we had discussed. And then somebody else had asked, how did American Jews respond to the news that the Jews of Europe were being murdered? So this is later. So was there an outcry? Was there... Um, were there more protests? Yeah, there's a massive outcry and more protests. Yeah, um, there's a day of mourning throughout the allied world, really. There are um, businesses and, and Jewish communities in South America and Central America and in the U.S. who um, have December 4th, 1942, about a week and a half after the, the revelation, um, have a day of mourning. You know, the, the newspaper Aufbau prints in all like a black bar, uh, border around that particular issue. Um, and, you know, as more and more information comes out, they're the ones who are at the forefront of the protest movement, um, asking the US to start doing more, um, trying to spread information, bring information in from the Polish government in exile about what's happening, um, spread it around because now it's, now we have to agree that it's true. Um, uh, it, you said that the Holocaust had no effect on the U.S. joining the war. Um, mm -hmm. This person's asking if you think that um, it might have been a factor in the Lend-Lease Act. I don't, um, in part because the U.S. does not know about the final solution um, when Lend-Lease is passed in the spring of 1940. Um, Lend-Lease is again portrayed as this is about freedom. Um, Lend-Lease is literally House Resolution 1776, which is numbered specifically to be emphasizing American freedom and emphasizing American freedom from Great Britain. So we are going to help Great Britain, but we are not rejoining Great Britain. They will not be subservient to us. We are passing House Resolution 1776 to aid Great Britain. And then in June, that is expanded to aid the Soviet Union once the Soviet Union is invaded by Nazi Germany as well. Um, so it's not really, it's not really about the Holocaust. Um, even the rhetoric that they give about persecuted people abroad, what they're talking about is everyone living under Nazi rule, not specifically Jews. It's really until 1944 that the U.S. does anything specifically aimed at Jews. And even then they use kind of this rhetoric of Jews and others, but behind the scenes, they are very clear that it is almost exclusively Jews that they're trying to help and that are suffering. And then I think that this will probably be our last question as I do know we're coming up on about 11 o'clock your time. And um, so um, we had a question just, it's, it's general. And so um, feel free to uh, respond in whatever way you see best. Um, but, and, and I'll try to condense it because there's a lot of stats in it, but what is the lesson yeah, to be I have learned? The, and, I, I you know, know which one you're gonna ask. I can yes, see it and the so too, there's yeah. a lot of information about you know, immigration and refugees. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a great question because you know, we, we come to a, an event like this, we hear all these numbers, we hear about all these experiences, and then we look around in our world and we wonder, you know, yes. at the end of the, the, the question is, what are your ideas to be a better activist? Yeah, 
That's a great question and I love ending with it. Um, this, is, this is kind of the way that I end when I'm giving a tour in the gallery. Um, I think we have a tendency to look back on the Holocaust as the easy one. Like it was so clear to know what to do. Absolutely, we should have changed our immigration laws. We should have protested harder. Um, we absolutely should have um, intervened earlier. Like it, it was so clear to know what to do back then, but gosh, it's just difficult now. And I think one of the things that this exhibit points out or that we try to point out is that it was really hard back then. There, were, there was a lot of context. There was a lot of information that Americans were dealing with. It was not always clear what was happening in Europe. It was not always clear what to do when people were living through it. But the people that we honor and the people that we remember are the ones who showed up for the rally, who wrote the letter to the editor, who tried to help a refugee family. And when we look at um, what we should do now, I think there's a tendency of us now to think, well, if I can't fix it, there's nothing I can do. And that's, I, I think that's wrong because I may not be able to fix Darfur or Syria or Burma, but I can do something to help. And breaking through that and deciding I will do something to help, going from belief to action um, is something that I, I hope that, that this exhibit pushes people to do, to think, Maybe I want to be the person that 70 years from now you look back and say, well, that person tried, like that person did something and that that something mattered. And so I, I think sometimes it's, it's doing a small act, but one person and then two people and then three people doing small acts it adds up to a really big act. And so that would be my takeaway for activists. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm seeing some thanks in the Q&A as well. So um, thank you so much for your presentation, for sticking with us this evening. I know, it, as I said, it's getting on to 11 o'clock your time. <laughs> so we appreciate you taking the time to do this. And for our educators who are joining us tomorrow, you'll have another chance to ask a Dr. Erbolding questions. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you all for thank coming. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.